welcome everybody. We can go ahead and find your seats. <coughs> and we can close the doors in the back. That would be super. Welcome everybody to uh, Integrated Mobility. We have a very exciting program for you today. Um, and we're going to let Julie White um, kick it off for us. <laughs> Um, first, I wanted to thank our conference committee staff for integrated mobility. If you're on our conference staff, can you raise your hand? <laughs> a lot of hard work that went into getting all the speakers lined up for us today. Um, and so we're very happy to have a full room to kick off our first session of integrated mobility. So with that, I'd like to uh, welcome Julie White to the stage. She is our secretary for multimodal transportation for NCBOT. She gave us a very uh, exciting uh, rundown of what her uh, groups have been up to this year. And she's going to um, introduce our speaker, Rusty Roberts, from the Bright Line. Thanks for being here, Julie. I think I did a good job selling the talk. Thanks for coming and hearing this. Um, this is such an important talk. I'll tell y'all, um, the DOT is actually filming it in the back. Um, because we wanted to be sure that as many people as possible can have the chance to see it, even if they couldn't be in the room today. Um, as I shared with y'all at the opening session, um, a couple of us took a trip down to Miami to see this project. Um, and it really, I think, was transformative. As we think of ourselves, as the Secretary said, as a rapidly growing state, then we have to think about how we're going to move people around between their communities, within their communities. Um, I often think about um, the folks at NCDOT that I work with every day that drive from Youngsville every day for their commute into downtown Raleigh, or the folks, we have people who drive from Roanoke Rapids every day so that they can live the quality of life that they want to live in Roanoke Rapids and they can get access to the job center that is um, the Triangle. And I think about that's what an hour and a half to two hour drive if you're coming from Roanoke Rapids every day, and that's today. And what we know is our congestion is growing enormously, right? So 65 to 72 people a day move to Wake County. What is gonna happen in 10 years when that drive is now two, two and a half hours? Folks who live in our Rim counties that are an important part of our workforce, an important part of our economic development success, will be closed off from the job center. And that is not okay. Uh, we need that workforce to support the, the downtowns of Raleigh and Durham and the RTP, and uh, those folks need access to those jobs. It's a really symbiotic relationship. And so when you look at our rail network in North Carolina, what's really exciting about it is we have it everywhere in the state. This model that we're going to talk about today, I think is first and foremost applicable for the S-Line project I talked about this morning in the Triangle. Um, but I think it's equally applicable in, uh, you know, out in the Asheville Parks of our state, Wilmington, Charlotte. We can really be connecting Goldsboro, Selma. We can be connecting so many communities via a strong rail program with reliable headways, with affordable service. But I think the key to that is to think beyond just the train. And so that's what we learned in, in Brightline when we went to Miami. Um, it was the chance to think about how we do development differently as a state. Um, I think of it as, here's our historic model, right? So we're like, hey, we should build a train station with Raleigh. So we go to the General Assembly and we say, can we have some money so that we can build a train station with Raleigh? And they say, sure, here's some money. We say, thank you. And we go and we build a train station with Raleigh. And John Kane says, oh, they're building a train station there. That is a money-making opportunity. And he builds the Dillon across the street and he makes a fortune, right? And then the city of Raleigh gets the property tax benefit of that project John Kane built, and Wake County gets the property tax of that project John Kane built, and we're done. And we go back to the General Assembly and we say, hey, can we have some money to go build a station in Charlotte? And that's a difficult revenue model to sustain growth and to be strategic about. Because what gave value to those projects were the trains running in and out of those projects. And we have to keep funding those trains, and we have to keep asking for more money to fund those trains. So this project, Brightline, gave us a chance to think differently about how do we, the state, get some of the throw-off of the investment that we made so that we can do our next investment. I think everybody would be thrilled if we could say, can we have a pot of money that we will invest, that we will see some return on, that we will then use to invest again. Uh, so I don't want to take up Rusty's time. I want to give him all the time he has. But I want y'all to really think about how this kind of development opportunity 
um, could be different for the state of North Carolina and for all parts of the state. And um, he's definitely going to take some questions at the end, so be thinking about that as well. Um, Rusty was so generous uh, to give of his time and come up here for us. Um, he has a background working on the Hill in D.C. He is the uh, government affairs guy at Brightline. He is the all-knowing, all-knowledgeable rail guy, uh, really, for everything. Brightline is just his latest thing that he does. Uh, we are incredibly honored to have somebody of his caliber here to share with us what he's doing. So thank you, Rusty, so much for coming. We appreciate it. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Glad to be here. Uh, thank you very much. I'm really excited. Uh, to, I am always excited when I get to talk about uh, the project that I'm working on because I always tell people right out of the box that what I'm working on is, in my view, the most exciting infrastructure project in America. Um, and in in uh, in reference to some of the remarks that she made about the the, the model and the development uh, and what other states are looking at, <clears throat> we we're, we're excited that we can be a model. Um, we. Well, I probably shouldn't say that. You know, we're a little different in that we're a private company building the model, and other states are looking to build a model, but, but maybe not with a private company to the extent that we are. Having private partners is very important, I think, to make something like this a success, especially when you talk about the development around the project. Uh, and so we're, we're uh, but we're an all private uh, company, all private project uh, that owns, that's lucky enough to own the real estate around uh, the stations, was lucky enough to own the railroad that we uh, are building the system on. And as a lot of folks know, if you follow rail, <clears throat> you know, the big problem with growing passenger rail in America is uh, having the freight companies versus the passenger side, which in most cases is Amtrak, you know, kind of work symbiotically, and that's very difficult uh, because everybody has their priorities. The freight uh, wants to move uh, their freight unimpeded. Uh, they don't want uh, um, they, they they want to make sure they're on time. Uh, the, the, the passenger railroads and mostly Amtrak uh, actually needs to be on time. It's pretty difficult for them if you've ridden Amtrak to be on time. But uh, so there's always that competition. Uh, we have we just bought the railroad, so we said to the freight company, okay, this is what we're going to do, and it's going to work a little bit better. Hard to do that model everywhere, uh, but I think we got to figure out a way uh, to utilize all these corridors, uh, because our model is, uh, well, we, we're, we're sort of breaking the model in, in many ways, but one model is to, is to use existing infrastructure that's already there to build a higher speed rail, and, and I say higher speed because we don't pretend to say we're the first high speed rail uh, private high-speed rail company America on the scale of what they were trying to do, they are trying to do in California or we have elsewhere in the world uh, 200 mile an hour type trains, but we believe using existing corridors that you can build higher speed, and in our case up to 125 miles per hour. When we're at grade it's up to 110 because that's the speed limit at grade. Uh, we think you, we can still make a modal shift and have people get out of their car and get in the train if you make it um, uh, reliable and convenient. And uh, the reliability in our case would be hourly service as opposed to maybe two times a day. Uh, and also, um, obviously, at a good price point that's competitive with car travel and with air travel. And so that's my summary, my opening summary. Um, Brightline, uh, as um, some people know, we've been at this for about six or seven years now. It was announced in 2012 when our company, after our company, Fortress Investment Group, uh, a New York-based equity firm, bought the railroad in 2007 and decided by 2012, maybe we could put passenger rail back on this railroad. Passenger rail that ran since 1968 uh, under the, uh, the name of Florida, the Flagler system, Florida East Coast Railway. Uh, and uh, by 2012, they had decided it might work. Um, we have great city pairs that we can do it, and uh, they pulled the trigger, and so uh, we're off and running. Uh, we branded as Brightline a couple of years ago, and we're real excited about the brand. But then, um, but then some some other guy showed up, um, that guy, uh, and uh, we're starting to change the name to Virgin. So I'm going to interchange the terms um, Brightline and Virgin quite a bit, and I'll explain. So I'm going to start off by this little video. Uh, this is a video that we did um, 
when we started our road show for investors. Uh, and so you'll so you'll note that some of the discussion in the video talks about the finances and, and the ramp up and the and the uh, the return on investment and that kind of thing, which is actually pretty important to know. So uh, we'll do this and then I'll get into other stuff. Our story begins in 1885 when American industrialist Henry Flagler, already well known for establishing Standard Oil alongside John D. Rockefeller, set his sights south and moved to Florida to pursue interest in real estate development. He would quickly become the driving force behind the growth and development of what is now the nation's third largest and most visited state. Fast forward to 2007 when all of Flagler's businesses, now collectively known as Florida East Coast Industries, FECI, were purchased by Fortress Investment Group. Given the growing congestion of Florida's major highways, especially I-95, it didn't take long for the team to recognize the opportunity to leverage existing rail infrastructure to connect Florida's cities with passenger rail. In 2018, after three years of construction, we opened Brightline, the nation's first privately funded high-speed passenger rail system. Our first route travels between Miami and West Palm Beach with a stop in Fort Lauderdale. Passenger rail, a transportation modality largely neglected for the last century, was suddenly revitalized in America. Contemporary cultural trends have made this new travel option all the more compelling. Increased demand for productivity while mobile, decreased demand for single vehicle ownership, the emergence of ride sharing to get people to and from train stations, and a general trend towards safer, more eco-friendly and experiential travel. By the end of 2018, we were carrying 100,000 passengers a month and had already become a critical component of the transportation network in South Florida. Our next step is expanding our Florida system to Orlando, with additional extensions planned for Disney World and Tampa. Our model has already proven successful in other markets where routes are too far to drive but too short to fly, where capture rates of the travel market average 20% and profit margins 50%. The second facet of our business model is the development of transit-oriented real estate. With the increasing urbanization of the U.S., people are seeking transit-oriented developments where they can live, work, play, and have access to great transportation. Our first planned expansion outside of Florida is Southern California to Las Vegas, a market which, like Florida, is a huge and congested route with 90 million visitors, 15 million residents, and over 50 million trips per year. Here we'll cut travel time from nearly three hours to just 90 minutes, all for less than the cost of gas and parking. Brightline, which will soon be known as Virgin Trains USA, is positioned as the most comfortable, reliable, fastest, cheapest, productive, and safest way to get people between highly populated cities that have congested corridors. We're positioned to transform regions and create connectivity between cities that was previously thought impossible. So that's, uh, that was our sales pitch to the investors. Um, we actually have raised um, in the tax exempt bonds uh, about $2.7 billion to build this. We've invested about $1.6 billion, a little bit more than that now, in our own equity. For a project that when it gets to Orlando will be uh, close to $4 billion uh, as, a, as an investment. Uh, for 235 miles, I think that's pretty good um, uh, for a CapEx. The, uh, the, uh, Comparison to something like in California, which I don't know, was 75 billion. The last I heard, uh, it was it's it's uh, the cost per mile is a bit different, and so that's why we think we we can uh, uh, make this make this success. I, I meant to start off by saying yesterday I was in Orlando. We're based in Miami. I'm headquartered in um, we're headquartered in Miami. I'm based in Orlando, an office at our train station in Orlando. So yesterday, I uh, and I'm about 30 miles from. The Orlando Airport, where the station is. So actually, yesterday I Ubered to the SunRail station, which is our commuter rail. Took the SunRail down to a station near the airport called Sand Lake Road. Was waiting for the county bus to take me to the airport, which is supposed to arrive at the same time as the train, but it didn't. And I kept waiting and waiting and waiting. So I called Uber, and uh, they took me to the airport, and then I flew flew up here. So I'm trying to walk the talk, right, <laughs> with regard to. Uh, with regard to this kind of new mobility, and I think it, it can work. Um, uh, it's certainly working there. Our two commuter rail systems in our state are continuing to increase their ridership. So we, um, uh, we're we looking at this market as a success, and I think we can claim the same thing with our Las Vegas market as uh, probably one of the most uh, uh, oh, uh, successful, potentially successful markets in the nation, and that's because of the city pairs that we have 
uh, we're growing state, North Carolina's a growing state as well. Oh, anybody in this room been to South Florida written bright line? Anybody? Wow, great. You all get free tickets for the next year just for raising your hand. Everybody else pays me. Um, and uh, see, I do that. I forget my flow, and then I ask questions, and I forgot where I was, but I'll get back to it. <laughs> but uh, um, so why I'm in Orlando, Orlando is the most visited city in America. Uh, Las Vegas, I think, likes to argue with us on that point, but we are. Uh, and so when we look at that, and we look at the, the international uh, makeup of South Florida and Miami in particular, uh, with a huge international population, international destination for business and tourism, Orlando is obviously a huge international destination as well. Um, we see that the uh, market of the market potential between those two city pairs can't compare it almost anywhere in the U.S. in order to make what we're doing a success. And we have to keep reminding people that we're in this business to actually make it sustainable, economically sustainable. So we're doing everything we can to put people in seats. Uh, and we have a so our marketing department is pretty large, probably the largest department we have. Uh, but Orlando was already up to 75 million visitors a year. Uh, and 126 uh, in, the, in the state. Um, and uh, it is um, continue, continue to grow. And then we have the largest cruise port in the world uh, within a mile of our station in Miami. And so uh, six million people just go to Miami to, to get on a cruise ship. And then Fort Lauderdale, uh, Fort Everglades also has cruise ships in Fort Canaveral up in the Cocoa area. So, uh, so we're, we're near all of those places and we're capturing those, those passengers. I mentioned uh, Richard Branson. Uh, he came to talk to us in 2018, in November of 2018, and said, I like what you're doing, right after we announced the Las Vegas project. And he said, I really like what you're doing. You guys look like you're disruptors in the industry. And he calls himself a disruptor in the industry. Uh, and so uh, he invested. We're still in charge. He's a, he's a minority investor, um, but uh, we still control the management of the company. Uh, and he shows up for good press events and to stand on the furniture when he wants a good photo op. Um, but he, he does show up to the, uh, to the when we need him to do things, and, and of course he can bring up the press like anybody. Uh, but our partnership is, uh, is more of a licensing branding agreement with him, and so we have a license to, to use his brand. And now we're part of the Virgin ecosystem uh, in terms of cross-pollination of customers. Um, uh, Virgin Atlantic Airways, Virgin Hotels, Virgin Tours, Virgin Hospitality, there's some other Virgin stuff too that we connect to. Virgin Voyages, he's starting his first ship out of Miami next year. So, uh, and we already, uh, we're noticing a lot of people going from our train station to the cruise ships already uh, with their luggage. So uh, we think that's going to be a great uh, partnership. His investment's um, uh, uh, good enough that uh, we'll keep his name and when, you know, Getting that Virgin brand, uh, instead of taking 20 years to build the Brightline band, we just got it overnight in 24 hours, and so we're really excited about that. And he's, his company is great to partner with. Uh, I mentioned in the video, why do we think we can be successful? This is our thesis. This is the only place we're going to try and build something. Uh, we don't want to compete with Amtrak. We want to go to corridors that are too long to drive and too short to fly. <coughs> and um, <coughs> that's what we have in Miami to Orlando, that's what we have in Las Vegas to Los Angeles. Uh, that's what you have between Atlanta and Charlotte. Uh, and so those are the corridors we would look to build these types of things. And you saw on the map other places in the country where we think it is, it is uh, possible. In Miami and Florida in particular, we counted, this says 500 million trips a year. It's probably more like 390 to 400 million as we revise our, our ridership market studies. But a lot of travel between those two city pairs in Florida. All we need to do is capture in the single digits in that market, and we will um, will be economically sustainable. Uh, so, and we're we're well on our way. We started in 2018, January of 2018, carrying passengers, um, and uh, uh, we have had a remarkable ramp up since then. So, by the end of 2018, we carried about 579,000 passengers our first year. Uh, that is more actually than a Acela carried in their first year of operation. Uh, I think that was in 2000, so you do have to account for population changes and things like that. But by June of uh, this past year, we reached our millionth passenger, and at the end of September, we already had 700,000 riders for this year. So we're growing. That's a 106% increase compared to a year ago through January, and our revenue has increased substantially. 
Um, and more than half of our people, we're still only running Miami to West Palm Beach at 65 miles. That's all we're running right now. We're under construction to Orlando, but more than half of them are using that longer segment. And we're finding all kinds of people, including me, who live in Orlando but have to work in South Florida, are taking their car to West Palm Beach, parking in our garage, and taking the train the rest of the way. Because traffic in I-95 is like I experienced yesterday, um, driving uh, into Raleigh at rush hour, uh, very slow, very unpredictable, <coughs> accidents, uh, and a, a what should be an hour and 15 minute drive between those two usually takes two to three hours uh, in South Florida. And so uh, people are just getting on our train at West Palm and saying, uh, and so we are, we're, we're, we're seeing a cultural shift, uh, as I call the modal shift in South Florida, as. Uh, uh, as people uh, go to West Palm and get in that train, and even north of uh, West Palm Beach and what we call the Treasure Coast area, some of the smaller towns, uh, people are driving down. So we're actually looking at uh, extending our system with additional stations uh, up there. Um, and uh, I mentioned in the video, we compare where we are to comparables to other systems around the country that are profitable. And these are all profitable systems you're looking at right here. Italo, a private system in Italy, the Eurostar, their profits are up and down. I, follow them, but they're, they're usually in the black. And the Acela, just by itself, take it out of the Amtrak equation, and they're almost $500 million a year in operating profits. Their capital expenses are different, so we won't go there. The other part of our success model is the fact that our stations uh, are in the core downtown centers, uh, and, that, uh, and that we have to link to multiple transit options. Uh, in South Florida in particular, it's remarkable the, the amount of uh, transit options we have. Um, and so this is, that red area on the map is the land in downtown Miami that Henry Flagler's original station was on 1895. Uh, and that station was torn down in 1970-ish after his last train ran in 68. Uh, they tore that station down and that red area is obviously a linear area because that was the track and if you kept going to, um, to your right, um, it, the train would have gone all the way to Key West. That's the corridor. And our company um, tore down the train station, paved it over um, nine acres, and put parking lots up, you know, put parking stripes in, put meters up, private parking meters. I used to live in Miami in the 80s, and I used to park in those lots, and I put money in the meter. I thought it was a county meter, right? Everyone thinks it's private meters owned by Flagler Development. And so for 40 years, this was a parking lot in downtown Miami, not the highest and best years. But this part of downtown Miami was dying uh, because uh, all, the, all the growth was moving to the south in an area called Brickell, which is the financial area. Uh, and this part is an area you just wouldn't go to anymore after 5 o'clock. Uh, and so we said, all right, let's put our train station there where Flagler's was because it connected to the railroad that already came down there and goes to the port of Miami. And so that, <laughs> A uh, particular area now is uh, is full of uh, is a six block long. We we bought two more acres, six block long acre train station um, that is as large as Grand Central uh, with 20 restaurants, two 30 story apartment buildings, one nine story office building, and another office building right behind it, uh, not attached but right behind it. Uh, it's a huge real estate development that's going to be three million suite one square feet when we finish, and we have room to build two more towers rated to go 90 stories by the FAA because Miami Airport's kind of down there. So we, um, we we're very excited about that opportunity to now develop that area. What's happening in downtown Miami in this area is a complete renaissance. And it's happened in West Palm Beach and Fort Lauderdale where we put a station. Uh, right next to our, uh, our property, uh, uh, Marriott is building a 1600 room hotel with 500,000 feet convention space. There's an area that, uh, does this have a pointer? Yes, it does. So there's an area right up there, all that area there, that has, it's 20 acres that a company called Miami World Center is redeveloping that entire area with towers, residential towers, office buildings, uh, including that Marriott I just mentioned, uh, totally rechanging the face of downtown, an urban center that was decaying that is now coming back. Uh, and the, the Miami Heat Arena is within walking distance of our station. Uh, in fact, we run a special Miami Heat train from West Palm Beach. That train will be waiting for you 30 minutes after the last buzzer so you can get home so you don't have to worry about parking and driving and drinking and all that kind of thing. And it's working out pretty well. We're also, and also we're, we're tied to the Metro Rail system. Two Metro Rail stations actually uh, adjoin our tracks. We have one 
right there on this side, another metro rail station there. So we have two metro rail stations uh, that um, you can, in fact, we built a platform. You don't have to touch the ground, get off our train, walk in the sky bridge over to the metro rail platform, get a metro rail, go to the airport, go wherever you want to go. Um, and uh, then they, downtown Miami has an automated people mover that loops around. It's right next to our station. You walk out to get in the people mover. Uh, and then Tri-Rail, which is the commuter rail in South Florida, which has never gone to downtown. Imagine a commuter rail that doesn't go to the downtown that it's supposed to be taking people to. It would it used to go to Hialeah and stop. And a couple of years ago, they finally connected to Miami Airport, which is pretty good. You need to have a, a rail system into the airport. But it still never went downtown because they weren't on our tracks. They're on old CSX tracks. And so we said, well, wait a minute. Would you like to go downtown? Because we found in North Miami-Dade where our tracks and their tracks were about a mile apart. So we connected them. We connected them. And so now every other tri-rail train, they're starting late this year, every other tri-rail train will go to downtown, one to the airport, one into our station. Some people say, oh, now how's that going to hurt you competitive-wise? We, we think that we complement each other. We're a different service. We have a different market, different demographic. So they have two platforms. It was a $60 million change order in our station, uh, all paid for, but we have, they have two platforms and people now can go into our stations. And we've noticed markets in other parts in South Florida, so we're adding stations in a place called Aventura. Uh, port Miami, we're putting a station right in the port next to the cruise ships. Uh, and uh, Boca Raton and then uh, near Cape Canaveral, which they call the Space Coast, and an area in probably Stewart, Fort Pierce, if people know Florida know where that is. Our trains, built in California, fabulous, luxurious. I noticed the new Acela trains that are coming out look very eerily similar to ours. But um, uh, we have two classes of service, and we do reserve seating, unlike Amtrak. So you get a car with a seat number, and you take your seat. You don't have to walk up and down the aisles and look for a seat. Uh, first class and coach. Uh, the first class, obviously, is wider seats. Uh, and then you, we um, have bike racks. Uh, we actually have carts that go down the aisle, so we serve you like in the airplane, your food and drink. First class, free champagne, free drinks, just like in the airplane. Uh, and our stations, I mentioned, are the most modern train stations you're going to see in America right now. We originally changed that Virgin. It used to say Brightline, now it says Virgin. Uh, that's, this is the uh, interior of our station in downtown uh, Miami. Um, and we decided, you know, it's funny, when we designed the station with these little V columns and six years ago, we weren't thinking of Richard Branson. But I swear to you, when he showed up, he said, perfect. <laughs> and, uh, and we started painting them red, lighting them up red at night. Uh, they weren't going to be red, but there's his red V for, for Virgin. So it kind of worked out pretty well uh, that, we, uh, uh, that we're working with him. And that's, a, that's one of our apartment towers. We didn't do condos. And in South Florida, people buy condos but don't live there because they're living up north, they're living in South America, something like, something like that. So we wanted people to live at our station. So we have rental apartments. Uh, we need to uh, create cities, communities around our train station so people can come to our station, ride the train, go to the restaurants. I mentioned 20 restaurants. They have a special elevator from our apartment buildings into our restaurant, restaurant level at our station, and it works pretty well. Beautiful station lounges. All that's going to change because we're remodeling already to Virgin. Brands, so that's where we go. And so now we just started construction about three weeks ago to Orlando, and we're building 180 miles of new track uh, all the way to Orlando <coughs> Airport. Uh, and uh, it is quite a, an amazing infrastructure project. I mentioned to folks that this is the most exciting, but it's also the largest private infrastructure project in America, privately funded project in America. Uh, and so with that, um, uh, we're, we, we, need, we need a lot of help, and uh, I'll show you what I'm talking about in a minute. Um, I was, let me segue back a minute because we're talking about development. I mentioned the three million square feet in Miami. In downtown Fort Lauderdale, we have eight acres. We're developing that in office and apartment buildings. And in downtown West Palm Beach, 1,400 new units that we haven't even built. We have our own tower, 30 stories. 1,400 new units have been built around our train station in downtown West Palm Beach since we announced this project. And similar thing is happening in West Palm Beach. It's, so it's just not real estate for us, but it's real estate around the community, around the area, and it is the, uh, it is the uh, uh, that, that, that urban re, re, renewal that uh, is making it important. Uh, so we're having a major impact on these downtown. When we head north on Flagler's Line, we get to uh, near Cape Canaveral, town of Cocoa, we hang a left. I mentioned existing corridors. So we've been using a railroad track until we hang a left there, what we call the Coca Curve, and we move into a state highway. 
it's a limited access highway. It's not interstate, but it's like an interstate called State Road 520 at the beach line. We're actually uh, leasing part of that corridor from the state of Florida uh, to build a track right next to their four-lane road, which will eventually be eight-lane, and we had to allow for that when we built our train. Uh, but we're going for 40 miles uh, along this, uh, it's a toll road, uh, into Orlando Airport where our station is. And so we're clearing and grubbing right now along that corridor, getting, to lay, getting ready to lay track. We'll be going 125 miles here, an hour here at this point, and right next to the highway. So it's going to be quite an amazing sight if you're driving, and we're hoping people will try and keep up with it. <laughs> uh, and as we get into Orlando Airport, uh, interestingly, this highway, this toll road, we actually, they wanted to expand their footprint because they knew they'd have to expand to eight lanes eventually from four. So we actually helped them buy 40 miles of new land, uh, 200 feet more linear width to expand their highway. And so we get 50 feet of that as part of the part of the easement agreement uh, when we help them make that purchase. So it worked out pretty well. Uh, and Orlando Airport is building, if anyone's flown into Orlando lately, you know it is massively crowded, kind of like Charlotte. You just can't move. It's so crowded. It's a sea of humanity. Uh, and there are 50 million people in an airport designed for 25 a year. So they're building a brand new terminal to the south with 120 new gates. And the center of that terminal is this this uh, train station, which has been built first because everyone's now being built around it, all the gates. Uh, and this was paid for partly with passenger facility charge funds and um, a grant from the legislature because half of it's a train station. <clears throat> we get part of it. Train station designed for four sets of trains. High speed rail, which is us. Uh, people mover to take to the other terminal, sun rail or commuter rail, which will be there eventually, and then maybe light rail to our tourist area. Um, they designed this in the 1990s and put it on the shelf. And they designed a high-speed rail station in the 1990s, put it on the shelf. And they thought maybe some, they figured one would happen someday, and we figured it was going to be a California style with the public financing. That fell apart. We came along and said we'd like to be the tenant, and so we're the tenant. So this is the one area where we cannot do uh, development around it because we're in the airport. <clears throat> but this will be the first airport in the nation to have an intermodal terminal center in the center of their footprint, airport footprint. Other airports like JFK and Miami have, you know, intermodal centers outside <coughs> of the footprint, but this is the first. Uh, so we're really excited. That's my office is in this building. We haven't built out our station yet. This is going to be public airport property, but our entrance, instead of being yellow, it'll be red. I haven't changed the slide yet. Um, and I mentioned construction. So uh, we, uh, being the largest infrastructure project in America, I, I would imagine all these firms you're seeing listed as few people representing these companies in the room. If you're, if you're representing a company that's not on this list, then you've missed the RFP, I guess. Um, but uh, it's a big, big project. In fact, we had to hire, we hired the three largest rail construction firms in the nation, Herzog, Stacey, and Whitbeck, and Railworks, to build our system in four different zones. And we had them, they formed a joint venture called HSR Constructors, and they opened an office. Uh, and so they're operating under a joint venture under the management of Herzog uh, right now to build this train system. So it's pretty exciting. And HNTV is our program manager, uh, but we have a lot of other firms involved with us, and uh, uh, those Friday morning 7.30 catch-up meetings are pretty exciting when everyone's giving an update of where we are and what we're doing. <clears throat> and uh, multiple headings. So we have teams doing multiple headings, building this project south to north, uh, starting in West Palm Beach all the way to Cocoa, uh, and this will be a three-year build-out project. Um, I love this slide. 2.3 million tons of granite and limestone used in this project. Uh, a lot of steel, a lot of spikes, a lot of bolts. Uh, 500,000 ties. Uh, we built a concrete tie plant in Fort Pierce along next to our railway corridor where all those concrete ties are being, are being built. Uh, and 20,000 rail cars transporting everything, including rail trains that one came in last week. Uh, pretty exciting to watch a rail train go by. Uh, and a lot of jobs. And so we're really excited about uh, the scope of this project. It's, uh, it's, it's having a major uh, effect on employment in Florida. And I love to talk about Sealed Quarter when I'm in North Carolina because that's where the term was coined, right? And, uh, and, and so we, we have, um, uh, obviously, we're going 110, so we have to build our stations, our crossings up to Sealed Quarter guidelines. And we're doing that. Uh, it's, uh, uh, it's interesting. Even though we're doing that, and I think every state across the nation has this issue with um, with uh, with um, incidents 
fatalities on the railroad. We have a lot of people who are who gate runners, a lot of people who commit suicide on the train. And, uh, and so we're having to go back and look at some of these crossings in the phase one where we're not going 110, so we're not required to do a sealed corridor, but we did do quiet zones, so we're, we have a lot of four quadrant gates and medians and things, but people are still running around the gates. Uh, and so we're going back and showing up some of those and putting more four quad gates and things like that. And then we have we have a uh, we have we have suicide problem uh, too, which is not unusual to us. <clears throat> so we do in a project of this scope, we have a lot of community engagement. I'm not going to give you give you time to read all of this, but a lot of community engagement, a lot of outreach to every uh, city and county along the quarter. Everybody's nervous when they see all this activity going on. So we spend a lot of money doing public service announcements, safety messages, and, during, and updates during construction, and also when we're running trains. And I mentioned suicide. We're right now um, partnering with an organization in uh, Palm Beach County called 211 Helpline, which 211 is a number all over the country for people for, you know, in crisis to call. <clears throat> and we're doing a special program with them for outreach to help reduce suicides on our railroad, which is the uh, that and gate runners are the highest, uh, you know, incident. Uh, and so, and then a lot of people are. At, their toxicology reports that come up that they're impaired in some way. So it's a real problem. So we're getting into suicide prevention uh, issues uh, with our train and it's, uh, we're hoping that'll. And I'll close with a couple of things. Uh, one is that uh, most people don't know it, but our trains are run on 100% vegetable-based biodiesel. We EPA tier four engines don't burn real diesel, we burn vegetables. <clears throat> Cooking oil, sugar, things like that. Uh, blended by Florida Power and Light in, in, uh, in South Florida. Uh, one train to Orlando will carry 400 people. It'll cost us 400,000 gallons of fuel to get to Orlando, so that's one person, one gallon of gas to going 235 miles. You can't do a better environmental footprint than that. Um, and so, and uh, we're doing a lot of solar around our trees. Uh, and we're the only train, I'll close with this, we're the only train that actually has a real security presence like TSA. Um, some people say, oh my God, really? Um, when you go to Amtrak, you don't go through any security. You just you might see a TSA person standing around or with a dog. Uh, but we built our stations knowing, thinking that someday something's going to happen in the United States on a train, and we and they will be forced to put in some sort of TSA presence. So we built the stations so we wouldn't have to retrofit. But then we decided, let's go ahead and do it now. Let's go ahead and put the security presence in. Uh, but it's very different than you'll see at the airport. When you go in, you will you will you will put your uh, bags through a a um, uh, a chute like you do at the airport, uh, and that's the only similarity to to TSA when you put your carry-on bag through the, the detector um, and it comes out the other side. Everything else is you don't have the magnetometer you walk through. We have these bollards coming out of the floor. They're you know very wide apart. They're about shoulder height. You just walk through. You keep your phone in your pocket, keep your keys in your pocket, keep your shoes on. You walk between these ballers. You have no idea you've been scanned, and somebody's looking at you on a TV screen, and he sees a red square in your pocket. Well, that's a cell phone, and we can tell by the metal content and the shape and the size what's in your pocket. Uh, and so the throughput is there's no delay at all. And of course, it's better in a train station because the flow is like it's quiet and it's busy and it's quiet and it's busy. So uh, it's working pretty well. When I've had the two chairmen, Republican chairman and a Democrat chairman <clears throat> of the House Transportation Committee come down from Washington and go through it. Former Chairman Schuster was there and he said, uh, why don't we do this in airports? And I said, well, you know, Mr. Chairman, we don't have to do low bidder. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Cut that out of the tape. <laughs> uh, it's really an amazing system and it works, works out pretty well. All right, so uh, last thing was Las Vegas to Hollywood. You already talked about it, and uh, it's uh, underway. We're, we just got our financing, half of our financing together. We're gonna start construction next year, we think. Uh, we're really excited about that project. Whole different team out there. I don't have to go out there, but other people do. Um, and I'm gonna take questions after this 90 second video. Or maybe not. <coughs> sound? Great pictures though, isn't it?
the dreamers, the adventurers. <laughs> Say hello to the day trippers, to the last minute field trips, to meaningful connections, to America's solution to traffic. Downtown Miami to downtown Fort Lauderdale to downtown West Palm Beach in about 30 minutes each for less than the cost of driving. And soon, Orlando and Tampa. Say hello to all the luxuries and amenities of first-class travel. And the freedom to actually get where you need to go. To a dynamic energy. To people and places you care about. To transforming downtown real estate. Say hello to a formula that can be replicated across the country. Atlanta to Charlotte, Dallas, Austin, Houston, San Antonio, Los Angeles to Vegas, Chicago to St. Louis, and say hello to the future of express intercity travel in America. Say hello to Brightline. In uh, Las Vegas, by the way, we're not using existing rail cord, but we're using Interstate 15 and uh, we've already negotiated rights to Interstate 15 all the way to Nevada and with California, all the way into Victorville, and then we're working on the extension into Palmdale, which will extend, connect to the Metro Link there and get us in. So this is another way that we think we're breaking the mold, just like we did in Florida, using a, a, um, a public highway uh, that we could use their corridor, rather than, stop that, rather than, um, Rather than uh, you know try a right a right away purchase that makes it so expensive that you're not going to be sustainable, uh, and and we we have to be sustainable. Uh, we mentioned the real estate, which is very very important, but we are designing this train to stand on its own. Uh, the real estate certainly helps us build communities around the station, brings people to the product, uh, revitalizes downtowns. Um, when Henry Flagler, by the way, founded Standard Oil, it was in the video with. Rockefeller came to Florida, bought a little short line railroad, and then put it together and started building all the way down to Key West, uh, mile by mile, founded the town of Palm Beach, built the Breakers Hotel, built the Ponce de Leon Hotel in St. Augustine. He had nine hotels by the time he got done. That was his business model. That was building a train, building hotels, and having a train to take people to his hotels, all his friends in New York. And so, uh, and he had a New York ticket office, take, take the, the Flagler line all the way to, to, to Miami and then to Key West. Um, and so that's, that's, and then Pennsylvania Railroad was the same thing, and the old railroads were the same way. This is what we want to do. We want to, we want to build a train that not only helps downtowns revitalize, but obviously um, has a business model, has a, has, a, has a revenue flow that can support it with a low capital expense uh, to support the revenue and support the system. Because as we know, trains are very expensive to uh, build and operate. And so uh, we think we're onto something. We're a proof of concept. We're still proving the concept. Um, and so getting to Orlando in 2022, when we plan to arrive there, I think we'll, uh, we'll really demonstrate that. And I am delighted that you guys listened and no snoring. And we uh, are happy to answer any questions you may have. Thanks very much. actually have had uh, several uh, oh, initial conversations with uh, people here in Raleigh and in Atlanta about doing something. I will, uh, and, and those conversations were pretty active for a little while, but it has gone a little quiet. Um, frankly, when the Las Vegas opportunity came up, we sort of shifted our focus uh, out there. And so that's where, we, you know, we, uh, we're hearing from people all over the country. Uh, I had the governor of Washington State happen to be at an event where he was at um, last year, happened to be near the election time. And um, he said, uh, could you come out here and look at maybe our Vancouver, Seattle, Portland route? And, you know, love to. And actually we did, you know, go out there and talk to him. And I didn't, but somebody on my team did. And uh, uh, Ohio asking us to come look out there. Uh, all over the country, Michigan, Detroit, Chicago. Uh, people are asking us to come and take a look at what they've got and could we make it happen here. And, and we started here. This is the first place we started talking to people because we think this is a very viable city pair, these two. Uh, but we have limited bandwidth uh, in terms of our company resources to build all this stuff. So I even heard from the Minister of Transportation from Sao Paulo, Brazil came here 
rode the train and said, could you guys come to Brazil and build one for us? So, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a lot, it's a great that there's so much excitement, but we have limited bandwidth, so we're trying to build up, uh, you know, what we can, when we can, when we, with the resources that we have. We're not ignoring this corridor. <laughs> She wanted to know what the square foot price of our of our, uh, our real estate rent. Well, that's, I can't remember what that is. Um, but um, well, interestingly, so downtown Miami is. is let me answer it this way. Um, as I mentioned, the area we're in has been pretty <coughs> neglected, and downtown Miami was never built as a place that people lived. You know, it's like a lot of towns. It's just. People went to work there, but there wasn't a whole lot of residential activity going on, even from the beginning, um, except for the closer neighborhoods. And so, so when people started building, especially in our area, you, it was it was cheap to build and it was cheap to rent. And so, but now everything is going through the roof, quite frankly, in, in cost of, of we're, we're, I don't think we'll never our apartments are less than two thousand dollars a month uh, for thirty five hundred. Uh, and so. Um, you know, that's, there's an affordable housing question that we always get when we go into these areas where we have affordable housing. Uh, we actually made a deal with the, we're in a CRA in Miami. We're not doing affordable housing in Miami, but we made a deal with the CRA uh, because it's close to a, a historically black neighborhood to do priority hiring in that neighborhood and that kind of thing. Um, but the real estate, uh, you know, our office building that we built right above our station, it's attached to our station, it's right above, we've already sold it. We sold that office building. So we're not keeping it, we're not keeping that revenue stream. We, we now somebody else owns it. And so we're not gonna do that with everything. But, uh, you know, we have the, we parceled all of our properties up that we're able to do that. Um, and so, I don't know if that answered your question, but that's best I can do on that one. Yes, ma'am. Slide, I think I took it out. Uh, she asked about what with we build the line, what's our consideration about sea level rise, which you might think about in Miami and uh, storms and that kind of thing. A couple of things. When Flagler was smart, he built this train in what they call the spine of Florida, and it's really a highland, it's a rise just off the coast, uh, the intercoastal, intracoastal waterway. Uh, so it's a little higher there along the railroad tracks. Uh, they are having flooding issues already in Miami Beach um, and in parts of Fort Lauderdale, but that's east of us. Um, I've never seen a storm surge in Miami come up as far as our train station, but I haven't lived that long either, so compared to, comparatively to the hurricanes. The 1935 hurricane that blew down, blew away Henry Flagler's Railroad in Key West was still, I think, almost the strongest on record, except for maybe the one that just hit the Bahamas, but um, I, we haven't had that problem in downtown Miami, nor where we are in Fort Lauderdale. Uh, Six, year, six years ago, Florida DOT got a grant, which is how we connected the CSX line, which is tri-rail and our line together, and Miami-Dade County and Palm Beach connected again, connected it together so they could move freight from w further west if they have to. So we have an issue, like Hurricane Katrina that took out CSX along the Mobile and all the area, Gulf Coast. We could move freight over from, say, off our line into their line uh, and the CSX line, and so uh, to keep freight moving. Both of them are considered strategic intermodal system corridors. Um, but we do have a team, we have a whole, we have a very strong safety and security team that's involved with um, um, threat management. So, and um, I don't know if I kept that slide or not, I don't think I did. Um, nope, that's other things. And so, um, you know, we're comfortable with, with our, what we built is going to last a long time. <clears throat> that that's a, should have been a short answer. <laughs> Yes, sir. Uh, electrification. Oh, in 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 Florida, no. Um, it's uh, it would be cost prohibitive. Let's say we're on an existing freight rail corridor that's been there 125 years. Uh, footprint would make it difficult. Freight company doesn't want to have all that stuff. Um, they still run uh, nearby, and then probably more more 
just as important as the cost is the neighbors, you know, aesthetically, I don't think they would like it. But we're running through some pretty nice areas, gated communities, through the middle of a golf course. Our train goes through the middle of a golf course. Fairways on both sides. Fortunately, the fairways are parallel to the tracks, not. <laughs> and so we didn't think it, we didn't think it would work. And it, we got enough trouble with the neighbors when we were building the way we did, complaining, I don't want more trains. God forbid we start putting all the catenary up. So uh, in Vegas, we, we're not, you know, we, in Las Vegas, California, we've definitely been looking at electrification. I think we've landed, though, on, on a biodiesel system like we have now. We were looking at it. But we'll be able to go 150 miles per hour. <coughs> even up, even up hill. Yes, sir? Great question. Now, what kind of leasing arrangements do we have with the state highway system? That little east 40 mile east west line I showed you, uh, part of it in one county <coughs> called Brevard, which is Cocoa Cape Canaveral, is owned by FDOT, uh, mm -hmm. actually the Turnpike Authority. Uh, then, as soon as we cross the line into Orange County, it's owned by the Central Florida Expressway Authority, which is a legislatively authorized authority to build a toll road. Uh, and that is a toll road. And interestingly, in Brevard County, there's no tolls, but as soon as you hit Orange, there's tolls. And so we had to do two agreements. With FDOT, which is a straight lease agreement um, to be uh, within their right of way, an annual lease. And with the Central Florida Expressway Authority, it's a 49-year easement because we have purchased the property uh, within a renewal of 49 years. Uh, in, or in Orlando Airport, um, there's a whole other set of arrangements. We actually, like the airlines, will actually pay the airport a passenger facility charge. Um, less than you would an airplane ticket. And we're paying rent on the station. Uh, that our portion of the station is about worth $50 million. It was publicly funded, but we're paying it back. He asked who's easier to work with, and I'm sorry, the, the question is garbled. I can't. <laughs> I'm not going to answer. <laughs> we have we have great partners in Florida DOT and the Expressway Authority. <laughs> At Orlando Airport, we, we are dealing with Homeland Security. But the rest of it in, in South Florida, no. We built our own system, um, and uh, it's, it's, you know, there were no special requirements put on us. And uh, you had one. Yeah, could you talk a little bit more about the freight passenger mix? Do you want us to know about the freight passenger mix? Oh, dispatching, great question. Sure, when Henry Flagler built his train railroad, it was originally a double track railroad. And he ran freight as well. In fact, the reason why he went to Key West, I'm sorry, I have to do this. The reason why he went to Key West is because Panama Canal was under construction. In 1900, he started building the Key West. But because he said that's the closest place to the United States, to Panama. And so he was gonna put a port in, Panam in Key West uh, for his freight. And the Navy, which pretty much owned Key West and still does, said, no, you're not. So he ended up doing just a, uh, leisure train. He built them the, later after he died. They built the hotel in Marriott down there. But he had a train that acts, so it's Cuba now. It's not Panama. And so you would you could buy a ticket to Havana in his New York sales office on his train. You roll into Key West. Your sleeper car would roll off the tracks onto a ferry on, with tracks. You know, the, the belly of a ferry boat would have tracks. You would stay in your sleeper car, cruise 90 miles to Havana. That train would roll off onto tracks in Cuba and you'd roam, roam the countryside. That's how he did it. Amazing. Uh, Are you guys gonna do that? <laughs> <laughs> Can't. So, so, so when freight, when passenger went out of business in 68, they pulled up one of the tracks because they don't need to maintain a track they don't really need with freight only. So we're putting that back. It's all double tracked again. We're double tracking now in phase two, but it's all double tracked in South Florida, some areas in, in three. Uh, FEC runs 14 freight trains a day right now. It's not a ton of trains. 
seven each way. It used to run 27, but their business is different. Uh, and so we're running um, 32 trains a day. Um, so how do we handle this batch? Very interesting. What we did, and we sold, by the way, FEC Railway. So we were part of one company, but we sold them all. Uh, so we said, how do we handle dispatch with kind of competing companies here? And so we agreed mutually to take dispatch out of FEC where it was and create a separate company called Florida Dispatch Company. And so it's like an ESOP. It is a separate company that is, we contract with, and FEC Railway contracts with the dispatch, us, us both. So it's like fair and balanced dispatching to steal a Fox News phrase. And so, um, and it's, it's interesting, it's working very, very well. Uh, and because, and also they're a unionized company, we're not. So that, that kind of solves that problem as well. So we're not having real re issues in terms of capacity and sharing with freight. And PTCs being installed, and by the way, Florida East Coast Railway in the um, 1990s installed the precursor to e PTC, it's called ATC, Automatic Train Control, which already prevents train to train collisions. So that's, that's one of the first railroads in the nation to do that. Cool, thanks everybody. Thanks everybody. I just wanted to take a moment to thank Julie White for her leadership uh, around all of the multimodal issues um, in North Carolina. Brightline is here today because she is uh, curious and goes out into the world and brings the best things back to North Carolina for us. So Julie, thank you so much for your leadership. All right, we're going to take a break. Make sure to get your PDHs as you leave the room. And if you didn't sign up as you came into the room, please take a moment to do that. Thanks and have a great conference.